up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you've had a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is not uh, the overwhelming amount of uh, coronavirus news that is out there that we've been covering for weeks and months, but rather a, a story that sparked a debate regarding societal norms. And at the, the center of that story, you have Florence Pugh. And Florence, if you don't know, she's a fantastic English actress. Loved all her last three movies, uh, Fighting With My Family, Midsommar, Little Women. But she's not in the news today for her acting, but rather her personal relationship. I was unaware of this until today. Florence, who is 24, is dating Zach Braff, who is 45. And just a few days ago, right, April 6th, Florence posts a photo of Zach Braff wishing him a happy birthday. And the reaction to that photo was so big and so overwhelming, Florence actually made a video addressing it. Within about eight minutes of the photo being posted, I had about 70% of the comments hurling abuse and being horrid and uh, basically bullying someone on my page. And as far as the hate and abuse that was being thrown out there, that was in general about the age gap. And a number of people commenting that it was weird, it was creepy, it was predatory. But regarding her age and the age difference we saw Florence say. I'll underline this fact. I am 24 years old. I do not need you to tell me who I should and should not love. And I would never in my life ever, ever tell anyone who they can and cannot love. It is not your place. Um, and really it has nothing to do with you. Also in this video, arguing of all the times for this to be a thing now makes no sense. It makes me upset, it makes me sad that during this time when we really all need to be together, we need to be supporting one another, we need to be loving one another, the world is aching and the world is dying and a few of you decided to, to bully for no reason. And I don't know when cyberbullying became trendy. I don't know when it became a point system. Right, and with this, ultimately saying, you know, if you can't respect her here, respect her saying, don't hurl these things at me on my page. I kindly ask that you unfollow me because that is not my page. Right, and following that video, even though, yes, you did still have people saying, well, I still find your relationship weird or it's creepy. You also had some people, including there was, a, there was an article written that she should not have been addressing this because it just feeds the trolls. But overwhelmingly, the reaction thus far has been support. From the likes of people like Ariana Grande, Olivia Wilde, Maisie Williams, as well as just people in general. And with this situation, regarding my opinion, and understand I'm, I'm coming into it fresh, uh, I'm, I'm exhausted right now, but fresh to this topic, new to this topic. Not that my opinion matters on this situation to the people involved, but I, I personally just don't care. Like if it turned out years ago, he, he was talking to her when she was a minor and there, there's like a conversation about it, was it grooming? Then yes, I, I would be disgusted and have a massive issue with that. But here I just see a 24 year old woman who's, who's in control of her body and her life making a choice. Now I will say here, I, I very much want to know what you think, whether you agree or disagree with me here, because I do want to note I have a huge Zach Braff bias Yes. Along with some other stuff, Scrubs made me laugh in very dark times. Uh, Garden State, oh man. That was sad, loner, emo Phil's favorite movie for years. But that and Donnie Darko on repeat, I would have been good for days back then. All right, so I do want to note that because that could affect my thinking here. Yeah, I think there's ultimately two different situations. One, what are your general thoughts regarding age gaps like this with men and women? But then also two, there's a, is it appropriate to say something about the relationship? Right, because I've seen a number of people responding to Florence's video like, how dare you tell me what I can or cannot say? Are people essentially acting like their speech is being shut down? No, whether it's good or bad, you can still say your opinion in other places, but she's saying if you're gonna say it on my page, which is essentially saying it to my face, then leave. And I personally understand her argument there because while I think a lot of people disconnect themselves from what they say online, I think more and more people over the years have realized it's not this just random different place, it's just an extension of real life. But once again, that's my opinion and I'd love to hear yours. Then in interesting news, as we're starting to see headlines like Walmart, Costco, Target are banned from selling non-essential items such as clothing and electronics in parts of the US, reportedly one company out there trying to get their products listed as essential is Trojan condoms. With the vice president of their marketing saying, more time together spells more sex. Trojan believes that condoms are essential to avoid STIs and unintended pregnancies that can be avoided with their use. And in their statement, they say if condoms were deemed non-essential items by retailers, consumers could face 30 day waiting periods for their packages, freezing. And here's the thing, this doesn't appear to be some kind of like cutesy marketing push or just a way for them to make sure they make money. The United Nations has said that they are concerned. They issued a statement after Carex, which makes one in every five condoms globally announced they would be producing 200 million fewer condoms between mid-March to mid-April due to closures. And you had a UN spokesperson saying, a shortage 
of condoms or any contraceptive could lead to an increase in unintended pregnancies with potentially devastating health and social consequences for adolescent girls, women, and their partners and families. So yeah, there's that. Not, not the shortage that I expected, but yeah, no, I, I see how it could be incredibly concerning. And then let's talk about Zoom popping back up in the news. You know, in this coronavirus pandemic, we've seen a number of apps just boom. That's definitely been the case regarding video conferencing apps. I mean, just look today, top free apps, Zoom, Hangouts, House Party, Google Duo. But the app that's seen the biggest boost and also connected to that the most scrutiny has been Zoom. You know, in previous coverage of Zoom, we talked about privacy and security concerns, some of which Zoom said that they were addressing. But even since then, we've seen more complaints and places banning it. This including the likes of Taiwan government agencies. It was banned in New York City schools. SpaceX banned it, Google banned it, Google citing security vulnerabilities. And in fact, today we saw the US Senate advising against using Zoom. Now with all of this, we've seen Zoom release a statement citing security security updates that they've put through this week. As Mashable notes, on Wednesday, the company updated its security features, including a new toolbar, so hosts have more control over meetings. It's also now hiding meeting IDs. This is notable because a lot of people were taking screenshots of their Zooms, posting it to social media, making it a lot easier for people to just bombard those streams. Or we talked about Zoom bombing last week. The main point with this story is something to keep in mind and something to be aware of as more and more people use Zoom every day for just everyday daily functions. And then let's talk about American jobs first more generally and then more specific. So first up, we learned today that last week, another 6.6 .6 million people filed for unemployment, right? So that means that just in the last month, that is 17 million unemployment claims. And that makes up almost 11% of the total workforce in America. And right now that is very much expected to keep going. According to reports, Bank of America economists anticipate 16 to 20 million jobs being cut with unemployment peaking at over 15% by June. And if it gets that high, it, it could take a couple years to get back down to pre-pandemic levels, which at the start of March, it was around 4.4%. Like we've talked about on the show, there, there's nothing that indicates that this is a situation where like a rubber band that's gonna snap back. And so that's a situation we're seeing with people losing their jobs, but what about people that still have them? Is, is everything fine, he said, leading to the next story? Well, no, they're not. Uh, for instance, all over the country, fast food workers have been striking, saying that they are not being protected while on the job. Right, they're still interacting with the public as they remain open to provide food during this crisis, which puts them at risk every single day. And this is starting with California, which is expected to see strikes throughout the state today. And these were inspired by strikes happening at a McDonald's in the Crenshaw neighborhood of Los Angeles, where a worker tested positive for the coronavirus. Workers saying they want a two week paid quarantine because they were all likely exposed to the virus, as well as healthcare coverage for workers and family members who might test positive. And on top of that, they want more personal protection equipment, sanitation measures, and other protocols to ensure their safety. There, they staged a walk up with signs on cars, demanded that health be prioritized, and their demands became even more urgent because two more workers there tested positive for the virus. This then inspired another protest in San Jose, where McDonald's employees say that they want hand sanitizer, masks, and other PPE. And that brings us to today, because now 50 fast food restaurants all over California will see similar strategies. Strikes, with reports saying that this goes past McDonald's, including workers from Burger King, Taco Bell, Domino's, Pizza Hut, and more. And this protest is being organized by Fight for 15, which is a movement aimed specifically at raising the minimum wage to $15, but also one that fights for workers' rights across all kinds of issues. And we saw their LA chapter outline the demands of the protest in a tweet, saying that on top of things like masks, gloves, and soap, they want hazard pay and paid sick leave for all fast food workers who have been exposed. And according to data collected by Fight for 15, most McDonald's workers find these kinds of tools hard to come by, with 92% saying there is limited or no availability to masks, another 46% saying this about gloves, 41 about hand sanitizer, 24% finding cleaning supplies hard to come by, and 15% saying this even just about soap. And these are also just base level problems that they've reportedly faced. Over 40% say that it's close to impossible to practice social distancing while at work. 22% have also said they've gone into work feeling sick since the epidemic started. And as far as why they've continued to go in, they, they've cited reasons like not having paid sick leave, not being able to afford missing work, or fear of disciplinary actions. Now on the other side of this, McDonald's has responded to some of this, with a spokesperson and telling Mercury News that they will be starting wellness checks, increasing cleaning, social distancing, and hand washing guidelines. But also, like I said earlier, this is not specifically about California. Nationwide, we're seeing these kinds of strikes. Last week, we saw 100 workers in the cities of St. Louis, Memphis, and Tampa walk off the job or just opt not to go to work, with one KFC employee telling the Memphis Flyer, I'm frustrated, angry, and confused as to why a multi-billion dollar corporation such as KFC wouldn't give us the things we need to survive, like hazard pay, healthcare, and paid sick leave. I mean, if they want to call us essential employees, then they should make us feel essential, treat us like human beings, and give us what we deserve. In Michigan, an anonymous McDonald's worker wrote a piece for Business Insider, writing, I have a compromised immune system and have been told that I'm not allowed to wear any kind of mask at work because it might, quote, put the customers off. And adding that all I can do if someone sneezes on their money before handing it to me is wash my hands two to three minutes later and hope they didn't have the coronavirus. And with this story, of course, while I'd love to know everyone's thoughts on the story and please share, I'd also like to ask those of you that are watching that are still out there as essential employees, does, does what you're hearing here ring true? Who do you work for? What's the experience? been? Do you also feel as vulnerable? And then let's talk about when we might see the end 
of COVID-19, or rather, when we might start seeing it die down. You know, a lot of people, including President Trump himself, have been optimistic about the virus dying down in the summer when things get warmer. However, in a letter to the White House, researchers with the National Academies of Sciences say that this is unlikely to happen. And that's because despite some evidence suggesting that this virus may transmit less efficiently in environments with higher ambient temperature and humidity, given the lack of host immunity globally, this reduction in transmission efficiency may not lead to a significant reduction in disease spread. With the report going on to say, there are many other factors besides environmental temperature, humidity, and survival of the virus outside of the host that influence and determine transmission rates among humans in the real world. With those researchers also pointing to countries with summer climates like Australia and Iran, which have both seen rapid spread of the virus. But that said, we're also beginning to see what could be the slowing of the spread in the United States, especially in places like New York. And yes, th that might seem kind of contradictory, considering yesterday we saw Governor Andrew Cuomo reporting 779 more deaths in the state, right? notably that being New York's highest single day death toll until today when Andrew Cuomo said that on Wednesday 799 people died. However, over the last few days, the number of people checking into hospitals for COVID-19 has stabilized and even started to go down. So because of that, there's been a lot of talk that New York could be starting to see a flattening of the curve. And just this morning, regarding this topic, you had Dr. Anthony Fauci speaking on the Today Show. You know, I don't want to jump the gun on that, Savannah, but I think that is the case. You you want to see a steady several day program and, and, and profile like that. I think that's what's going on. I'm always very cautious about jumping the gun and saying, well, we, we have turned the corner. But I think we are really looking at the beginning of that, which would really be very encouraging. We need that right now. With Fauci also saying that while he previously estimated the coronavirus would kill 100,000 to 240,000 Americans, he now expects that number to be somewhere around 60,000 because of social distancing. But having said that, we better be careful that we don't say, okay, we're doing so well, we could pull back. We still have to put our foot on the accelerator when it comes to the mitigation and the physical separation. And yesterday we also saw Governor Cuomo echoing that message. We took dramatic actions in this state. We, New York pause program to close down schools, businesses, social distancing, and it's working. It is flattening the curve, and we see that again today uh, so far. Meaning what? Meaning that curve is flattening because we are flattening the curve by what we are doing. If we stop what we are doing, you will see that curve change. That curve is purely a function of what we do day in and day out. And I think that part of the reason these two and other experts are hitting on this is, is you don't want people to get kind of relaxed. Because there are going to be people that try to spin lower death numbers as a way of going, oh, see, everyone was overreacting. Even though the thing we're seeing from health experts is that these lower estimates are now based off of all of this intervention. Right? And if people get too comfortable, they don't take social distancing as seriously anymore, then we could be looking at those larger numbers again. Now, regarding this situation, Cuomo also indicated that New York is in for the long haul here. And oddly enough, it was over a question regarding Broadway, right? You have the Broadway League announcing tentative plans to reopen by June 7. However, you had Cuomo warning people not to use that as a barometer for when other non-essential businesses could reopen. Cuomo saying decisions to reopen places like schools and workplaces, those needed to come first. And ultimately, those decisions will rely on infection rates and the state's ability to protect people in the vulnerable population. We've also seen infection rates in Washington and Oregon drop, likely because of social distancing. In California, the virus is also slowing, but you still had Governor Gavin Newsom projecting the peak of the outbreak would happen mid-May. Right, so notably, that could mean waiting to lift lockdown measures. However, yesterday we also saw Attorney General Bill Barr speaking to Fox News. There, he suggested that once the White House's social distancing measures expire at the end of this month, the government should start potentially easing lockdown measures. I think we have to be very careful to make sure this is, you know, that the, that the draconian measures that are being adopted are fully justified and they're not alternative ways of protecting people. And I think, you know, uh, when, this, when this period of time this, uh, at the end of April expires, I think we have to uh, allow people to adapt more than we have and not just tell people to go home and hide under the bed, but allow them to, to use other ways, social distancing and other means, uh, to protect themselves. But ultimately, that's where we are with this situation now. You know, we're gonna have to wait to see what happens next. You know, the United States is a big country. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of focus on New York, but also, I mean, yesterday we had Dr. Burke saying some of the next potential hotspots could include DC as well as Philadelphia. As right, so well, I'm hopeful and I'm happy to see that the measures that have been taken rather late, uh, which is way better than never. I think we need to be careful and, you know, be cautiously optimistic that the efforts are, are working, but not just abandon the efforts. But that is where I'm going to end today's show. And hey, if you liked the video, hit us with a like. If you're new here, definitely hit that subscribe button. Also, if you're looking for more to watch, here are the last two Philip DeFranco shows I put out. We got hit this week, so I think some people missed them. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you liked the video. Subscribe if you like it.